uh, share in some smaller groups. I'll be leaving for those, but other people might sh share on, uh, stay on for some smaller groups. So uh, good to see you. Welcome. Let's meditate together, set up a good posture. We'll practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is bringing our attention to our direct experience in the present moment. I taught in person for the first time uh, since the pandemic hit uh, a couple of weeks ago at a cannabis for a cannabis company. Uh, I forgot how I forgot what it's like to teach in person. It's so much better. <laughs> It's so much better for me. 70% of my abilities as a teacher are taken away from I this week still get something out of it, right? But feeling the energy of each other sitting together. Well, that'll happen again. I'm sure that'll happen again. But even over this platform, I, I, when I sit with a group, but there's something more powerful to it than that I'm just sitting by myself in my own practice. We do get a sense of each other's Mindfulness. So mindfulness is paying attention to what is happening as it's happening in the present moment. When we know we're all seasoned meditators here, our minds don't naturally do that. They take encouragement. A habituation, a cultivation, cultivating like you're growing a garden, cultivating mindfulness. How do we grow it? What are the conditions that help to ripen this awareness? What are the habits? What nourishes it? What waters it? We know it brings benefit, harmony, helps us to live in tune with life, as the Buddha used to say. With that as an instruction in your mindfulness, how to live more in tune right, right at this moment. And I have been working in my personal practice with the instructions, just as are written in the Satipatthana Sutta. Using the breath as the anchor for our attention. But the instructions also say, breathing in and calming the body. Breathing out and calming the body. Take that as the only instruction for the first minute or so. Breathing in, calming the activity of the body. Breathing out, calming the activity of the body.
And the other instruction is breathing in aware or sensitive to, sensitive to your whole body. Breathing out, sensitive to your whole body. And then breathing in and know you're breathing in. Breathing out and know you're breathing out. No other job to do, allow yourself that. Use those words to help Ground the mind, breathing in on the inhale, breathing out on the exhale.
and aware of how the heart is affected. Various states visiting us on the cushion. Just know how the heart affected, just as it is. Not trying to change. Our mind states, our emotions, but investigating them. You might feel the tension well up in your body at various times, initiating from the mind, but we don't always catch it there. Just come back to that, breathe in, relaxing the activity of the body. Breathe out, relax the activity of the body.
not taking pleasant experiences as anything good or bad, not taking unpleasant, uncomfortable experiences. They come when we sit still in fluctuation throughout our life. We know how to be uncomfortable. We have many, many times before. It might be helpful just to name it, simply unpleasant or simply pleasant. Allowing these vicissitudes to come and to go.
Okay, welcome everybody. If you uh, just joined, I'm Melissa stepping in for Trudy today. I do believe she's back next week, though. Something else has come up in her family, so that that might be a that may or may not happen. You can always check on the website to see when she'll be here. Um, somebody in the comments just said that this is the favorite part of their week. Uh, and that is what the Dhamma or the Dharma is intended for, to be a refuge for people, to be soothing to our weary hearts, to our pains, to our sufferings, to our sorrows, a refuge for that, to heal that inside of us. And also a place of uh, reasonableness, rationality, realistic truthfulness. In these uh, troubled times, not that trouble is new, <laughs> But the news, our particular news, is highlighting very distressing events in the world, giving our attention to maybe we've been ignoring other distressing events in the world. So there's always been distress across the world, right? Uh, but the Karaniya Metta Sutta keeps coming into my mind. Here's what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. That phrase, the, the beginning phrase, the Karaniya Metta Sutta. Here's what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and knows the path of peace, particularly that phrase, the path of peace. There's a path to peace. And there's a road to peace. There's steps we can take towards peace. There's, there's a path is leading upward, there's a path that is leading to destruction, to non-peace. I have a friend who shared with me, he was in a, went for a walk in a rural area of Sonoma County, and there was a uh, person lying uh, in the grass, passed out uh, with a bottle of whiskey next to him kind of early in the morning, so wet, dewy grass. And he was really shaken by this sight. And I thought, well, you know, I lived in New York. We see it all the time, LA, right? Those of us like, okay, I, I get it. And then he kept bringing it up and brought it up later, like he wanted to get the image out of his head. And then, and then he brought it up again. And I, so I finally, I asked him, I said, what was the feeling that came up for you when you when you saw that person? And he said, fear. And I said, fear of what? And he said, that I will end up like that. And he happens to be, to be taking steps in his life that could potentially lead down that road with abuse of alcohol and other, other things in his life. So when I see a person like that, maybe when you see a person in these conditions, you don't have that fear because you're not taking those kinds of steps in your life. So he said he wanted to get that person out of his head. And I thought, well, don't try to get that person out of your head. You know, it's just like uh, the Buddha, right? It reminded me so much of his walk that he took when he went out and he saw a dead body, he saw a sick person. He saw these were his awakening moments that made him want to look for the end of suffering. This is a beautiful awakening moment for this person. Take in that suffering. And so we have to do that for ourselves where we see suffering in the world. Often maybe we don't want to look at it. And there are, you know, skillful times where it's better just to turn away or to pay attention in a wise way, not uh, taking on hysterical reactions of others for example, taking in the truth, but staying balanced with that. But I was reading about somebody who's kind of hailed in Buddhist communities as a, one of the great world leaders, but he's known that way in academic leaders too, as a, a ruler of India, about 250 BCE, you've probably heard of Ashoka. 
who was a uh, at first a kind of hard-handed leader. He came into power in a in a brutal way, killing his brothers to get power. Um, he was engaged in a lot of war. And then at one point, the war uh, and the suffering that was coming about, the killing that was coming out from the war, the suffering, woke him up. And uh, he took advice from a Buddhist monk and began leading with the Dhamma as his guide. And he made all kinds of changes. And I like to think about him because I would I like to envision that maybe world leaders could <laughs> take up the advice now of Ashoka. He said he wanted uh, the happiness of all people, like he wanted the happiness of his own children. So not just the happiness for those that were dear to him, not just the happiness of the people in his country, but the happiness of all people. This is the essence of metta, loving kindness, love, universal friendliness. So he led with metta. And the path to peace in the Karanian Metta Sutta is this establishment of metta to consider, take care of, nourish, cultivate the thought of the well-being, safety, happiness, and peace of all people. And that's what gets hindered. The vision of that is in our hearts. It gets hindered by egoic wishes, identity wishes, the only the uh, wishes for my family, my people, my country. And then we get blind to another, to the other, and we other the other, right? So the path of peace is the cultivation of loving kindness. I'll read the Karaniya Metta Sutta in whole in a minute. But what Ashoka did with this loving kindness is uh, he spoke of a, a state morality what he based his administration upon to lead to a more just, more spiritually inclined society and an individual morality where he encouraged people to practice. He reformed the judicial system to make it less harsh, less open to abuse. He made medicines available to every human being and animal, made it unlawful to kill certain animals where he used to go on country tours in festivals, he now went doing Dharma practice, touring the country, meditating. He tried to foster respect towards parents, elders, teachers, friends, servants. He encouraged generosity to the poor, to your friends and relatives, to monks. He encouraged harmlessness towards all living beings. And that's the aspect that he repeated again and again in these edicts that were found on pillars in India and Afghanistan. One thing that was repeated on these pillars was to preserve life. His edicts didn't push Buddhist doctrine. He also uh, encouraged tolerance of all religions and practices. The Dhamma just meant this cultivating of the good qualities of the human, human heart, which is basically what Buddhism is, right? You don't have to put a Buddhist ideology. If he had people in his uh, community that were Christians, if they didn't matter, you know, or Muslims, it doesn't matter. If you're cultivating a good heart, that goodness will have an effect on the society. But the emphasis on protecting life, the first principle on the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which is what Trudy has been telling me she's been talking about in this group, the Noble Eightfold Path is broken up in Burma into three categories. Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. 
sila is our ethical practice or conduct conduct maybe you don't like that i got graded for conduct in catholic school i would frequently get f's in conduct when i was a kid <laughs> but now i like the word con conduct how we conduct I, I wasn't bad or i just talked a lot i wasn't mean kid i was just chatty so i'd get an f the nuns gave me f's in conduct <laughs> uh so con conduct the way we conduct with ourselves in the world samadhi is uh, the concentrate the ability to concentrate the mind experience joyful rapturous states they're natural states they're not buddhist states they exist in us right now if we r removed the wavering mind that would be there this natural luminosity this joy this clarity and then panya is wisdom, the wisdom of knowing how to live in tune with life, how to live in harmony with life, how to bring about harmony, peace, love. There's steps, there's things, there's way to do it, do it and there's way not to do it. And obviously world leaders are ignorant of this wisdom. Not all but a lot of them. The foundational work, the thing to establish, which a lot of people don't like to talk about. They think they can skip over this part or, I know we don't like rules, right? I, I get it, I don't like rules either. But is this not refraining from certain actions? And the first one of that is to not kill. And we can all imagine if the world would just live by that one thing, the changes that would happen. To in all cases possible, protect life. How can we do that? That Let that be our guiding principle. Protect life, protect life, protect life. The Buddha told Kunda, one of his followers, as all harmful states lead downward, internal states, so hatred, all harmful states lead us downward. And all harmless states lead upwards. Even so, a person giving to harmfulness has harmlessness to lead them upward. So we're all given to harmfulness. And there's a, a quote from a a Russian novelist, a Soviet dissident. The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. Inside us, it oscillates with the years, and even within the hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridge head of good is retained, and even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. That's what we see when we sit down in Vipassana meditation and, and study our hearts like, oh, oh, I have hatred in me. I have the seeds of destruction in me. I have the seeds of war in me and violence. They're in there. And, and we all have the seeds of compassion. And whatever we frequently think about or ponder upon will become the inclination of the mind. Bhavana, the word for meditation, also means the beautification of the mind. That's the way they translate it in, in Burma. We're cultivating beautif beautification of the mind through the cultivation. So as all harmful states lead downward, there's a path down and there's a path up. A person giving to killing living beings has the abstention from killing living beings to lead them upward. A person giving to taking what has not been given has the abstention from it. A person being harmful in their sexuality has the abstention of them as a way of upwardness. And this isn't um, upward in the sense of somebody with some moral authority is judging you. Oh, now you're uplifted in their eyes. It really is in line with the nature of things that nature protects us when we live in line with the Dhamma, with the way things are. 
and we get uplifted. The Buddha would say to practice, he would list specific benefits that come from everything that he taught, from metta practice, from mindfulness practice, from concentration practice, the blissful states that come from that. He would list how to even gain fame or wealth. There are causes to put in. He told his monks, it is not right for you to wish for things, but put in the causes for them and they will come. It is the nature of things that they will come. So it is the nature of things that we get lifted up when we put in these beautiful guiding principles of the Noble Eightfold Path. And we just need guidance, humans do. It's so easy for the heart to get corrupted, to move astray and power corrupts. So how great of Ashoka to be in a very powerful position and then come back and see he was being corrupted and he needed some guidance. And he started to guide from a place, a real concern. And people can start out that way. I know people have moved on to political positions in the world. They start out that way. They can start out that way. <laughs> They've got, we all got some good intentions in there, but they can so easily be corrupted. So I am grateful for the guide. I need reminding. I need repetition. I need to hear the Dharma again so that I remember that I can refine this being, being one that doesn't perpetuate harm in the world. We don't always see the benefits of our practice immediately, you might have noticed. I mean, you can see that right within a meditation sit. Sometimes doing the practice brings a lot of the demons to the surface. And really they're meant to, it's meant to. Doing the practice will draw out afflictive states. And so we have to stay and sit with that. And it might feel like, God, why am I doing this? Because nothing good of, is coming of it. But, but then we stay, we stay, we stay. And later on, we feel the benefits of the practice. There's a great story uh, in this book, which I recommend on loving kindness. No, you can't see me, yeah. Loving Kindness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana. It's one of my favorite loving kindness books, speaking about the practice. Uh, but he tells a story of a person named Maga who lived in a village that was not clean, it was dusty. And he cleaned an area for himself. Uh, so he would have a place to stand. And each time he cleaned an area for himself, somebody would come along and push him out of the way and take his area. And when he, when they did, he would say, this is very good that people are happy to stand on a clean spot. And he would just go and clean another area for himself. And that kept happening. And Maga went on cleaning roads. He made roads smooth by removing big rocks, trimmed branches of trees that were obstructing the road mended broken roads and repaired dilapidated bridges. Seeing Maga laboring, another man asked what he was doing. He said, I'm preparing my way to go to heaven. This man asked him, can I join you? Of course you are welcome. The road to heaven is open to everyone. Come on and join me, said Matt, Maga. This man joined him in a similar way, one by one, 32 more people joined Maga. The community of 33 people led by Maga went on cleaning roads, repairing roads, cleaning rivers, rebuilding broken bridges, and helping poor people build their homes. Their intention was to clean their villages for the people to enjoy living in a clean environment. One day, when they were engaged in their work in a certain village, the village headman asked them what they were doing. They explained to him that they were preparing the path to heaven. Thinking that the king would be disappointed with him for neglecting his duty, 
of taking care of that area. The village headman feared he might lose his job and became ang angry. So he fabricated a story, compiled a list of false accusations and complained to the king that some thieves were plundering the village. The king without investigating properly ordered his police to arrest these 33 people and bring them to him. Following the king's orders, the police arrested them and brought them to the king. Without any investigation, the king imposed a severe punishment upon them and he ordered they be trampled to death by an elephant. Maga said to his companions, friends, we should not hold any grudge against the man who falsely accused us, nor against the king who imposed the severe punishment upon us. Our hearts are clean. We know we are doing something wholesome. We are creating a very pleasant environment to a very healthy and pleasant life. We are putting our metta into physical action. Anybody can see how healthy people are now. People appreciate what we are doing. We stand our ground. Don't give up your noble work. Don't get discouraged from your practice. We continue our remarkably wholesome act. Our defense is the metta practice. With thoughts of loving kindness in their minds, they remained calm and peaceful. When the elephant was released to trample them, the village headman leading the elephant on was surprised when the elephant stopped and turned around to go back and would not trample the 33 people. When the king learned about this, he knew there must be reason for an animal to turn around. He brought the 33 to him and Maga and his companions informed the king they were not thieves, but rather they had been cleaning the village, clearing the path to go to heaven. The elephant had thus seen and responded to the friendliness in their hearts in the way the village headman had not. The king was thus very pleased and he gave them the entire village with the necessary facilities to live and Maga and his companions continued to do the good deeds. So that felt like very metaphorical for how I've seen my practice manifest. We do the practice to lead to benefit. And the Buddha taught, said intelligent, it's intelligent to know that if you live in this way, the benefit will come to you. And we may not see that benefit, but over time what happens is sada begins to develop in us. And that's sada is the faith that is a Buddhist faith, which is established and verified within your own experience. So in whatever large or small ways these, each of us has already had experienced how practice has benefited us. Is that right? Have you had a benefit? Have you noticed a benefit? We don't do this work unless it benefits us, right? It's too hard. But when we see that, we can reinforce it, notice it, draw the line to the cause and effect. So somebody said that in my class recently. He said, I'm trying to pay attention more to the causes and effects. And I was like, perfect, just do that. <laughs> That's all we need. Because Buddhism is not a belief system. But they do say, if you're going to start with initial belief on everything, believe that actions have consequences, that our actions have consequences. If world leaders understood that actions have consequences, they couldn't start a war. They wouldn't be able to. They'll know they're going to suffer the, the consequences of those actions. There's a path to peace. There's a path to good things. That's not it. That isn't it. So the path to peace, what is the path of peace? This is what should be done by one who's skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace, says the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which if you're unfamiliar with it, it can be very soothing to read when you're feeling despair, when you're feeling overwhelmed by the world, when you're feeling depressed, when you just need a little soothing message for your heart. It's chanted regularly in Buddhist communities, various times. 
Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them do not the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, the medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living fear, near and far, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or, or will, ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness all over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing, sitting, walking or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding here and now by not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one having clarity of vision being freed from all sense di desires is not born again into this world. I just learned recently, a little side note about the translation. Another translation of that last line is not born in a womb again. And I just learned recently that devas, the celestial beings and Buddhist cosmology, which you don't have to believe in or not, but apparently they're spontaneously reborn. So that's why it's a divine, this is the upward leading path. There are realms of existence where beings are spontaneously not born through a womb. That's interesting. <laughs> so metta, how do we call upon it when we're faced with um, people who cause harm in the world? The Buddha gave very specific advice about this. And the, and the way the sutta reads it is not how we would talk about it necessarily in, in life. Uh, the Buddha talked that in a sutta that there are people that have very friendly, warm, loving, are very warm and friendly verbally, but have bad actions. Uh, there are people that have are warm in their actions, but verbally are a little bit harsh. So he said it like this, but pretty much what he meant is, uh, you know, there are people that are good in some ways, they have good qualities, they're on good uplifting paths and there are people uh, in varying degrees, they have not such good qualities. And then there are people that have very, very few, if any good qualities at all. So he talked about dealing with those people in a certain way in each case, he made these metaphors for focusing on the good in other people. This is said to be the proximate cause and bringing out the qualities of loving kindness for them. So in that way, you draw that out of that person. So you can think about not the most unfriendly person in your life, if this is difficult, but just your friends and family. All of them have their strengths and drawbacks, right? Uh, he gave a metaphor of just as when you have a, a rag that is partially soiled, you use the part of it that is still clean. You work with that part of it. So do you draw out the good behavior of, of, of other people, focusing on that, using that part. I find this really helpful when working with my family members, just as a little metaphor. And then he talked about If there was a hoof print and there was water in that hoof print that was even muddy and soiled and somebody came up along and they were parched to draw out of that hoof print of water what they could use of it uh, to nourish their thirst and those people that have very, very little qualities. And then he talked about people that have uh, 
absolutely seem to have absolutely no good qualities coming out in them. They're very destructive people, very hostile people. He said to regard such people as if they're sick. And that was something I heard early on in my practice that really helped me to draw up compassion and to not let the seeds of anger grow in my own heart towards other people. So focusing on the good, the proximate cause for, for the path to peace, the Karaniya Metta Sutta. So we, we, we are, I don't know if any of you here are in charge of policies for the world. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but we are in charge of policies around our own homes, and we are in charge of policies around our own hearts. And we cannot underestimate or we shouldn't underestimate how valuable each one of our practices and anybody that is willing to try to put in the effort in their life to bring peace. Okay, so that's me talking. We'll take a couple of questions now. But let me just say about uh, the questions that I won't take any questions in the comment sections. And if you're gonna ask a question, you have to unmute and turn your camera on. Uh, so those are the conditions of asking a question and also ask questions pertaining to your particular practice. So be very clear about your question and let it come about your particular practice, your practice. Go ahead, Clark. Um, good morning. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for leading us. This is wonderful and lots to think about. Um, my experience in the practice this morning, since that's my focus by your instructions, is uh, surprisingly, I wound up crying through half of this meditation, which is the only time I think I've ever done that. And I was sitting with that and uh, it related as you were talking about the upward path and the downward path and it struck me that the upward the upward path can in fact have things that are sad and disturbing and the thing i was crying about was i just recently my husband asked me this morning am i feeling sad about our son leaving for college mm -hmm. And it broke a little dam that I had been getting closer to realizing how sad I feel about it. Mm -hmm. And um, what was so interesting is that, of course, it's a beautiful, natural thing. This is what we want. We want him to launch and go out there. And it's so uh, sorrowful for me right now because I'm going to miss him so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's such an interesting thing that it is a beautiful upward path and it has great sorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of just, uh, you know, noting that in this I irony of, of our Buddhist uh, thoughts all the time that it's like, I guess vaguely some part of me is thinking, well, the upward path is a, it's a nice and easy <laughs> And I'm sitting here with great sorrow going, this is good sorrow. Good sorrow is okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good sorrow is exactly what you're experiencing. And then the bad is remorseful, regretful kind of sorrow, you know. But I relate, Clark, my, uh, my uh, husband's son just moved out. And it was funny. It didn't have that impact on me because he's my stepson. And, but um but the and I didn't my husband didn't have any anticipation but the day he left suddenly I saw the yeah it was a big transition you get used to it quick if I can <laughs> <laughs> no I'll get relieved at some point but yes yes there's a whole like that's the thing about a death of a thing is that it creates a birth of something else you know we see it as a void for a little while, but n never does a void actually exist. You know, but I am interested in that sorrow is like I, I was looking at it because I was with it for a while and I was going, what is this? And it's interesting that it took me all the way back to heartbreak, my first heartbreak with a 
with a lover when we broke up, it is this feeling of heart where I just, there is this uh, feeling where I'm going, I think of him and I go, it's anticipatory missing, you know, yeah. I'm going to be missing, I'm going to be missing. Him. <laughs> and it's so interesting, like I had no idea I'm this hooked to whatever that was. Uh, you know, I take it for granted. So there, it, it, the sorrow is, so, I mean, he's still going to be in the world. I'll still be able to talk to him. I don't know. It's an odd little sorrow about what is it? Because I see him every day. I'm thinking it will be tragic when I don't see him every day. And I'm going, why? I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a good description of the mind. And it's important for us all to really look at that because that's the unnecessary suffering that the mind will do to us when we don't live right in the present moment. The You said it very nicely, anticipatory sorrow, the anticipation of the sorrow we're going to feel, maybe you will, maybe you won't, you know, and you don't have to take that on, but that's what the mind will do when it's thinking about the past or thinking about the future. And then we're missing, we're in pain in the moments that we're actually really present with, with that person. Um, uh, and that's what clinging does. If we, if, I've probably talked about this here, but I really love looking at the definition of what is translated as attachment sometimes or clinging is, comes from a word, upadana. And you could look it up. Just the, the wiki uh, translation is good, is good uh, sufficient translation. Um, because it's really interesting to note clinging when it's happening in our lives and what the, the way it obscures the mind, what it makes this, the, the mind do, what are we clinging to? It doesn't talk about clinging to people, but clinging to the ideas of things the idea of your son still being there, the idea of the pleasantness of that experience or, you know, the, the way clinging manifests as a causal condition for suffering for us is a really wonderful place. And we all cling, everybody who, who here doesn't cling. You would not be here if you didn't cling. <laughs> you wouldn't need to be wouldn't need to be, wouldn't feel stress. We cling, we cling. So clinging beings, we can't just say, don't cling anymore to your mind. You can't, no, a clinging mind clings. But you can be tender with that place and go, what are you doing clinging? Let me check you out, you know? And just the way you, you described, that's what you did, Claire, by noticing the anticipatory sorrow or missing, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Marilyn? Thanks for calling on me. Um, tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of my husband's younger brother's death. He died at uh, just age 66. Your husband, Here's, say that again, Marilyn. My husband's younger brother. Younger my, brother? My brother-in-law. Okay, yeah. And I guess because of that anniversary, um, and also you're talking about people that are really just seem to have very little goodness in them. I've been thinking about uh, my husband's other brother, Mark, who uh, happens to also have died just uh, couple of months ago. And um, I've, I've known both of these boys through our church, through our high school youth group. I met them before I met my husband, before I met my husband. And so I've known them for like 60 years, wow. 55, 60 years, wow. sort of childhood friends. And I have such anathema towards the older brother that just died, Mark, and have for almost all of those years. What does that mean, that word? Uh, repulsion to um, okay, just thanks. real anger and fear. Mm. I feel like he's, he's 
evil. He's damaged his wife. He's damaged his three emotional, mostly three emotional abuse. His three daughters finally fled the house and went into foster care to get away from. There was some fault on both parents' side, but. Um, and then I'm very close to the daughters. I have seen up close how much damage he did. He was in favor of the older sons, made the girls feel worthless. Some physical abuse. So when I think of him, especially since he died, I'm trying to use a forgiveness practice. Please forgive me, I forgive you, I forgive myself. And that, that allows me to soften a little bit with him. But I'm still just seething. Still just seething. And we don't really know what to do with all that anger. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like to figure out a way to help my nieces. 22, 23, and 30 now. I'd like to figure out a way to help them deal with it, but I can't do much except sympathize. Yeah. Tell them they didn't deserve that. Are they angry? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So the thing, you know, we don't want to feel these feelings, but uh, the only way out of them is is really through. And so that Mara of, of anger, that particular aspect of Mara, uh, the Buddha gave one instruction for, and that is to, if what you're doing sounds like it was helping, by the way, just keep doing that. If it brings some softness, then that's a lot. Well, that's better than nothing. And the fact it's huge because it can be hard to access those places. So more of that, more of that, it's chipping away. It sounds like it's chipping away. And then another tool in addition to that is the mindfulness practice that we just did. And that very simple of like, Mara, I see you, which means I see you. You know, I really see you. Anger, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let myself see you. And every time it visits, then let yourself feel it and, and see it. I do this with my son sometimes. And after I did it with my son, I was like, maybe I need to do that with myself too, uh, which is when he would have a strong emotion to uh, lay down, put his hand on his heart, name the emotion and see where he feels it in his body. And then I would ask him, can you let it be there? Can you let it be there? And that non-resistance to it helped also, just the way you described, helps to, to, to soften it. So it's just something that needs yeah. to heal. You know, it's just a wound and it needs to heal. And mindfulness is absolutely a medicine for it. And forgiveness is absolutely a medicine for it. So you're already doing that. But give yourself some space to... I love that phrase, Mara, I see you. And I do use that occasionally, uh, although it had not occurred to me to use it. Yeah, I love it it's, too. It's and just, I, it's so disarming of Mara. It is. Instead of fighting her, it's just Mara, I see you. <laughs> see you. Yeah, just see. Just see. And because you, you see as the the anger, we start what well, we start to see, and we don't want to shame anger, you know, and women can particularly uh, shame their anger culturally, if they've picked up the cultural condition that women aren't supposed to be angry, then mm -hmm. an extra layer of anger on top of the anger can come on that in the form of shame. Yeah, but it doesn't heal from that, you know, it heals from love alone. So we, we learn by applying love to the anger that arises in us, just what heals it. And we could do that to our own anger. It makes us very powerful in the world too. And transform, be like those, you know, be able to disarm a trampling elephant even. <laughs> and when it comes up for my nieces, which it did big time when he died recently, 
um, it was my best service I could do for them just to listen and just say, yeah, he was a jerk. Yeah, exactly. it's a yeah, unfortunately, we can't take away that from other people. It's one thing the Buddha said again and again, you got to do the work yourself, you know, they have to do the work themselves. And the, uh, the other thing that comes with that Brahma Vihar is equanimity. And equanimity helps us to hold that, mm -hmm. that they have their own conditioning to deal with. You had to deal with all yours. You can deal with all yours. They have all their conditioning. They can deal with it. It gives us a, a very clear non-codependent kind of uh, boundary where we don't pick up the responsibility for other people's mm -hmm. what they have to deal with in their life, you know, causes and conditions. Yeah. You, you said uh, the Buddha's instruction for someone that was really, really seemed to have no good in them was to recarbon the sick. And um, that resonates for me. Uh, think of Marcus mentally ill. You know, I, I, when I, when I first heard that, I had to talk myself into that. I was doing it like I was like, but it worked, so it was fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now I see it as something that's actually very true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's close with some uh, metta practice then. Thank you for your efforts and your practice today. Try to pretend you're in the Santa Monica meditation hall where you, you won't shift in fidgets. <laughs> still body for you to still your mind. The body has to be still first. Well, sometimes we got to move the body to make it able to be still, go on a vigorous walk. Do some yoga, exercise, and then and then we can settle. Establishing this love and kindness first for yourself. Wishing yourself safety, protection, health, happiness, and peace. May I be safe, healthy, happy, and peaceful. May I be free from war inside my heart. May my heart be at peace. Sending those thoughts to those suffering in the world. Our attention being drawn to Russia and Ukraine. May they see each other as brothers and sisters. 
regard each other's welfare, safety, happiness, and peace. May they be free from the delusions of hatred, hostility, violence. May peace prevail and to other conflicts around the world, Yemen and others, wherever. Your heart goes, Syria. Considering the safety, health, and peace of all involved, excluding none. And may all beings everywhere, north, south, east, west, above, and below, be safe, healthy, happy, and peaceful. free from violence, free from oppression. May all beings everywhere live with ease. And dedicate your practice, share the merit of your practice towards any beings that are you are particularly moved by. May my practice contribute to peace in this world, in this particular area of the world, to this particular person. May my practice benefit all beings everywhere. Thank you for your practice, everybody. A pleasure sitting with you uh, today. Again, check Inside LA uh, website if you want to know about uh, Trudy coming next week. I'm doing a Monday night series on Buddhist practice in the time of war now, uh, starting in April. If you're interested in that, it's on the website also. I want to make sure I uh, answered. Uh, Marilyn, you asked the title of the book is Loving Kindness in Plain English. If you Google that, loving kindness in plain English, you'll come up with Bhante Gunaratana is the Thank you. title. Yeah, you're welcome. And I'll hand it off to you, Alex. Thank, Thank you, Alex. You.